welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Campbell. I'm a doula in Washoe County, Nevada, a Medicaid provider, a lactation educator, childbirth educator, and mom of 18. You can find me and connect on doulainreno.com. Remember, give a shout out to those who are brave enough to share their stories with us on how they have become parents. Let's dive in. Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Campbell, and today I'm here with Michael Allison. How are you? I'm good, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this very interesting past, and I want you to just jump in and tell us about your journey to becoming a parent. Yeah, so my journey into becoming a parent started when I met my son's mom. I was uh, coming back from Japan, and um, she was actually uh, working at Walmart in the jewelry department. And I um, I went to introduce myself to her, and uh, we uh, dated for a little bit, but then we we lost track uh, in regards to our connection with with each other. So I went off to uh, California to serve in the military. Went to Iraq. And then um, she used to like writing me letters and different things when I was serving. So we st- stepped in co- kept in contact. And then uh, when I came back from Iraq, uh, we uh, started working back on our relationship. And it was towards my time of getting out of the out of the service. Uh, we re- reconnected, and then when we got reconnected. I proposed to her. We got married within like a couple of weeks right after that. And then shortly after that, we uh, moved into moved into our new house. We uh, I got out of the military, moved to Columbia, South Carolina. And after living together for like about a month, uh, she got pregnant. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, after that, uh, obviously, we uh, knew we had a child on the way. And then, you know, so I got a job working on the railroad and I'm working on a railroad and I got laid off. And when mm-hmm. I got laid off, um, she moved back to Miami. I'm mm-hmm. trying to figure things out. And then I eventually moved back to Miami and it worked out when the same time I got laid off, I w- it was August 18, 2007, and I was home for the birth of my child when I got laid mm. off. So it kind of worked out, but uh, that's how I uh, became a dad, became a parent, and my son was born on that day. And he just turned uh, 17 about two weeks ago. <laughs> Goes by so fast, so fast. I know my oldest is 32 and I'm like, so weird because I'm still 32. So I don't even know how that's possible, but it goes by so fast, doesn't it? It's like a blink. It does. It does. Time flies, you know, because as I'm I'm now with my current wife and we're talking about she was she's she's been in my son's life ever since he was two years old. Holy cow. And, and uh she was like, Man, he's about to be out of the house in less than a year. You know what I mean? So time do fly. Yeah. I first want to thank you for your service. I was uh, Air Force dependent. Um, I'm a TRICARE provider as a doula. It means an awful lot to me. I want to shout out that you have a Purple Heart. We have some stuff behind you. You are a, for a combat veteran and um, really just proud of you and thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Yeah. me. Well, it means a lot to me. I got to live my very first world problems and while you were off fighting for me so like that's uh, that's lucky for me you remarried when your son was two so at some point that relationship unfortunately came to an end I you I'm not sure how much you can share about that but just I know that it did you were a single dad so take me through like first of all what was it like when your son was born for you as a dad watching that and seeing that and then take me through some of the other big events that happened most definitely so when it was time to become a dad um It was obviously new, um, and my experience of knowing what a dad was was from my own dad. So I grew up with my dad, but I was kind of like the kid that grew up with the dad, but the dad that was a working dad. So my dad preached like hard work and working hard. So my dad was the dad that was a provider. So he worked two to three jobs my whole life ever since I was a kid. So I didn't grow up with the dad that was like, I love you, I love you. I didn't grow up with the dad that was at my football game, my basketball games, and those types of things and stuff like that. He was more so of a provider. So being put into this particular position and being able to have a son was kind of new for me in regards to like any structural type of examples or anything like that you want to mm-hmm. say. So being there for him was obviously uh, was a joy for me, a little bit scary, but it was something that I said that 
I'm excited to take on this uh, new chapter into my life and something that I'm going to accept and embrace and make sure that I'm a part of his life every single step of the way. And that's the commitment that I made to myself and to him that I will always be in his life to be there, love him, support him and care for him and be there if, if he ever needs me for anything. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, um, with him, when he was born, um, he was a cute, chubby little baby. His nickname we call him is uh, Chubby because <laughs> he had uh, big chubby cheeks. So, um, you know, me, we, we, uh, we had our relationship going in regards to like where we was living at things that we were doing as parents. But after a while, we started struggling as in regards to like co-parenting and how we was living. So I, uh, I moved from Columbia, South Carolina and eventually moved to uh, Macon, Georgia, because the railroad actually rehired me as a management uh, in a management position mm -hmm. and was trying to make the best of our relationship. But after uh, the death of my grandfather, I came back mm -hmm. and um, we had a, a very rough patch and I filed for divorce and our relationship ended. And when our relationship ended, I became a single dad and had to go through the entire custody battle situation and the child support and the, all those things that, that came with that. And it was very hard for us because now you're tearing apart this young little baby. So every time that we would, the way it worked out where we were, he wasn't in school or anything like that. So, and we lived in two different states. Yeah. So he was li we're living kind of like half of the year. So half of the year he was with his mom, half of the year he was with me. And but in in between that we could travel and see our kid in between that, and it was very heart wrenching every single time that I would have to leave him or the vice versa, and just to see him cry and break down and those types of things, and it was very 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 hard on us for quite a few years, but eventually it worked out where the tables kind of turned a little bit, and um, he got a chance to come and start living with me. I eventually moved on from that job, and I went on to Washington D.C. to work for the government. And he was living with me for a good bit. And when he was living with me, um, I was going through, I was on my second marriage and I was going through um, another divorce uh, for my mm -hmm. second marriage. And at this particular moment, I uh, got with my company and I said, hey, could I relocate back to South Florida where my son is living? And once I had a chance to relocate back to South Florida, I was back in his life full time to be a full-time dad, be a full-time parent, be completely present with everything that he had going on. So it turned out to be a blessing in that regards and to our like being in his life the whole time. But it was quite a few different, you know, transitional things that was taking place because he saw me and his mom break up. Then he saw me get back with some, he saw me go through the single dad phase of being a single dad. Then he saw me remarry. And after going through a remarriage, then I went through another divorce from the second marriage and I'm back to being a single dad again. And then he saw his dad go go through that and trying to figure things out with some of the things that I was dealing with personally. And then I so lately, me and my actually me and my second wife remarried and got back together again. So that's how she's been in his life the entire time. So we got we just got remarried our last year. Oh wow. I get it because I've been divorced and you know, I was I was having coffee with one of my most of my kids are adults, my 24-year-old daughter this morning. And I'm like, the hardest part about being a parent is thinking you want to do such a good job. Your kids are your top priority. You're trying, you're giving your best every single day. And that looks different because, you know, some days you're sick or you're going through your own stuff. And it's knowing that you're part of what screwed up your own kids, you know, like, because you're, you're growing up while you're raising them, you're still living your life. You still have normal struggles. Exactly. And when your kids see that and you know that they do, I mean, perfection, of course, doesn't exist, but it's so hard as a parent when your kids realize, I feel the worst for my oldest child, you know, because like she saw the worst of me as a parent because she mm -hmm. was experiencing everything first. And it's so hard to go through those struggles and know your kids are seeing them and wish that that wasn't the case. And it's it's hard. It, it was very hard. As you were saying that, I, I thought about the all of the transitions that my son saw. So I thought about when me and his mom broke up and he, now he's seeing both of the people that was caring for him is now in separate households and he's being put on airplanes and cars. And yeah. it was kind of, it was actually kind of nasty for a while. So we were, were kind of like in that immature phase of like two people breaking up and it wasn't yep. the, the best breakup. So then you, 
you heard either the yelling, the cursing, you heard the uh, names or some of the games that, that are being played with the phones and don't talk to the phone, you know, all the, 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 these uh, silly things that take place. And then once we both decided to go our, obviously go our own separate ways, but in regards to like seeing other people and dating and other people being introduced to your kids and stuff like that, that became so, even harder. That's that became so hard. harder for, for him, for us, because it's kind of like someone else is help, helping raising your child and that's an adjustment, something that I've never experienced. Um, so yeah. that was kind of crazy for us, crazy for him as well to actually see that, accept that. And that was a big struggle for me as well as a dad. And then when we went through the, uh, the custody battle, it was in court. And now he's starting to see a whole bunch of things come up in court. A lot of things is being said. And you know, he's having people talk to him about his mom and his dad and kind of like make a decision, make a choice. So that was really like tugging on him. And he, he started crying because he doesn't want to be in this particular situation to deal with these things. So as a dad, I felt like, man, how could I make the situation better for him? How could we, how could we fix this? You know, so I actually had to like sit down with him and have some real tough conversations with my son once he got a little bit older and start to understand some of the things that was actually taking place. But right. uh, that was tough. You know, and then once we, I, w I got married for the second time again, you know, kind of had, I had to like retell some of the same stories and just kind of like, for me, it was like a, a, a check, a gut check for me though, regards to like being a dad and always like reassuring him that his dad is there for him, his dad cared for him and that his dad is working through some things and stuff like that. So that was one of the biggest challenges, but as he got a little bit older and started I guess adjusting to kind of like understand it. I kind of wish it was not the norm, but it kind of yeah. like it was kind of like something that he was like, "Well, you kind of done this before. You kind of been through this before." So it was kind of like, "I don't want to. I don't want to have to keep putting him through this situation." So I actually had to start working on myself too as well. So those are some of the challenges that we had, but we obviously we did work through that. Yeah, it's it's hard, and I mean. That's not the plan going into having right. kids, right? It's it's right. so challenging. So I feel that very much. Once you finish the military, you're working for the railroad, your government job, did that launch you into what you're doing now? Was that so, pivotal? Actually, what, what launched me into doing what I'm doing now in regards to being an entrepreneur, being a speaker mm -hmm. and telling my story, it's actually was when I was in Tampa, Florida, and I was at probably that the worst of my worst in my life and in my career, but I was actually going through this second divorce. And prior to that, I uh, was, I was on 13 different medications around for our mental health. And then, wow. yeah, 13 different medications, seeing different psychiatrists, different doctors, different counselors, you name it. And then prior to that, I was kind of like a person that was bottling a whole bunch of emotions and a bunch of feelings while I was still working at this job, because I was dealing with a whole bunch of internal things that I, I was not able to uh, face or deal with. And the reason why I was prior to that, the previous company that I worked with, when I left that company, I uh, experienced a uh, suicide as a supervisor working on a railroad. So when I showed up to that railroad uh, suicide, it immediately brought me back to being in Iraq. And in Iraq, uh, my tent got blown up by a car bomb. And eventually, while I came back to you, we other guys got injured, and my best friend Salto he got blown up by this car bomb, and we had to put him in a body bag. And that's when I started going on this mental health journey because I was trying to get help. But I went to the supervisors, told them what was going on with me with my mental health, and I eventually got let go from the job. So ever since then, I kind of had the mindset of never speaking about it, never dealing with it, and it eventually poured into my from my personal life, poured into my job, poured in with my my current wife, and I really didn't know how to adjust to that, deal with that. Anyhow, that brought me to the brinks of trying to take my life and try to commit suicide when I was there oh, in Tampa. Oh, Michael. Okay. Yeah. So obviously I did not, but I got my weapon. I had tied 50 pounds of weight to my leg and I was going to take my life that night. But it actually was within that moment. I thought about a couple of things with my parents in regards to a letter that I wrote to my parents when I was in boot camp. And then it just brought to to the forefront all of the work that I did as a dad to be there in my son's life and the promise that I made to him to never leave him. And that from there, my, my entire life turned around, you know, so that's when I started getting like true counseling, trying to, I got off of 13 different medications and just trying to go to, I went to Rush University, 
I went to our Emory Hospital to get all of the help that I needed around PTSD. Trying to just grab, try to like face all the things that I was grappling with. And then I got into these different men's group, got got into different people, got different people in my life to help change my life. And from there, I've been on the path of all of these things helped me to become a better person, a better version of myself, which eventually led to me writing a book and telling people how I changed my life and how I became the person that I am now today. And for me, writing the book, people asking me to tell my story, get on stage and tell my story too. And from then I said, hey, let me um, create this company where I could take everything that has helped me and try to pour back into people, which is why we created the Adversity Academy, which launched me into entrepreneurship, where we have the personal development programs and the professional development programs too as well. How do you get off of 13 medications? Was that, first of all, I mean, I already thanked you for your service, but I don't think people understand. And PTSD can come from a lot of things. So I, mm -hmm. I think people definitely understand that. You can get into a bad car accident. You can have a, a dysfunctional relationship. I mean, there are lots of ways that PTSD happens, but that's massive and it's huge. And sometimes it's hard to tap into where that's coming from. I, I mean, I know getting your tent blown up, that's an obvious thing, but there are probably a lot of other things that happen that contributed to that once a PTSD happens. You know, I feel like other stuff from your past or from, but from before and after that main event, things can kind of funnel in because you're so, such a um, living in that trigger, living in yep. that you're yeah. absolutely right. So when I say I'm a person that bottling a whole bunch of emotions and feelings, I actually suffered from PTSD, not even knowing what PTSD was long before that. So when I came to America, I was molested by a family member at seven years old. And then a couple of years later, I joined the Boy Scouts. I'm in Washington, D.C. on a trip. And on the last day of the trip, I come out of the shower. I see on the wall. There's five other boys on the wall naked. And I was told to get on that wall too as well. And I experienced something that no kid, no, no kid should ever experience in their lives. And that shut me down for years. And yep. I didn't really know how to deal with a lot, quite a few things. And I didn't know how to challenge. I didn't even know how to talk to anybody about that because of, of how it crushed me personally on the inside. Mm -hmm. And I carried that with me my my whole adult life. And Obviously, when I served in the military, obviously, I got hit with another traumatic thing. I went through a divorce. And from that divorce, honestly, to tell you the truth, I got a DUI the same night I got that that, that divorce. And I had to deal with that and struggled yeah. throughout that time period. And I was had a whole bunch of anger, a whole bunch of shame, a whole bunch of guilt, a whole bunch of grief that I was dealing with and really didn't know how to deal with that. So that's what led to a lot of lots of bad decisions that I was making uh, personally and professionally. And eventually when I decided to go and get the help, you know, I got treated it for different medications and different things and different counseling and stuff like that, trying to see what worked, what didn't work. And after being on 13 different medications, I started getting really groggy. I started like really yeah. having like a foggy brain. I, I, I didn't want to get up in the morning. I started putting on weight crazy. And I went to the psychiatrist and I said, look, I, I don't know what the hell is going on, but get me the hell off of this because I feel like I'm just getting stupider and stupider and fatter and fatter. <laughs> you do not want the medication that makes you fat and stupid. You definitely say no to that. <laughs> That's terrible. So eventually um, we started weaning myself off of that. And it took several, several years, to, it took close to maybe like two years to get out, to get actually getting off of no medication. Yep. And then just started going to like a whole bunch of holistic things. So started doing things around like the yoga, the meditation. I started getting into um, the, the uh, therapy with a whole bunch of veterans, like uh, doing whole different types of sports and gotten into much, got, got back into the gym. Um, and some those were some of the things that uh, really started helping me and helped change my life. And I've been off of medications for the past 15 years now or so. That's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. I'm very so proud of you. Now, I want to segue. You use language on your website about limiting beliefs. Do you do anything with NLP? Because that's big with them also. Yeah, so I've partnered with quite a few different um, companies in regards to using NLP in some of our practices and some of our services, because for myself, 
you know, I had all of these limiting beliefs tied to quite a few different childhood traumas, quite a few different things from the military. And it was a struggle for me to get out of bed. It was a struggle for me to take activity. It was a struggle for me to take inaction, take action, which led to inactions and just implement and just try to change my life. And mm -hmm. every morning I found that I was selling myself a whole bunch of things. And I was the one that was buying every single thing that I was selling. <laughs> right? <laughs> It doesn't suck when you find out it was you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it was the limiting beliefs that was always holding me back and keeping me back from where I was at and not thinking I was uh, worthy and didn't have any value within myself. And I had to get out of that funk and actually raise my hand to get the help that I needed. And once I did that, yeah. everything in my life started to change ever since then. I'm an NLP practitioner. So I, I, saw the language on your website and I was like, I think I know what's going on here. That's awesome. <laughs> I want to do another shout out. You have nine books and a podcast. I want you to go through and talk about that. And then I want to wrap up with remarrying your second wife and blending Absolutely. families. Yeah. So tell me about the yeah, books. So, that's a that's so, an achievement. Thank you so much. So we mm -hmm. went out and um I went on a verge of just saying I'm just gonna start dumping every single thing that I've learned throughout my life, all of the things that I've uh, accomplished in my life and just start putting those into books. So we went out and uh, me and my team and we sat down and we said, we're going to write a book about breaking the bottle the on leadership. We're going to write the book about overcoming adversity, getting your life back on track. Um, when I got into business, I had to learn a lot about business credit. Then I had mm -hmm. to learn about personal credit. Then um, I wanted to write a book that was kind of based, based off of my uh, faith and some of those principles around that. So I wrote a book with a Christian type of a, uh, type of, um, I guess, uh, origin to it, or that's for helping leaders and things like that. And then from there, I uh, wanted to get out and write a book that could help kids overcome their limiting beliefs and things like that. So we wrote a book for kids. And ever since then, I um, overcoming adversity has always been my challenge, and I've learned how to do that. And I wanted to speak to people, talk to people who has been through some challenges, been through some tough things in their lives, and then go out and, and let them come on our podcast and start empowering people with their stories. Mm -hmm. I've heard some amazing stories that I've learned from so many people. Uh, I've interviewed people that yeah. have either been in jail, people that have been raped, people that have killed people, and how they came and turned their lives around. And that's the, the, the cool thing about the podcast is you're going to get people from all walks of life. I've interviewed, interviewed over 126 people that's been on my podcast. So I've heard so many different stories, so many different different challenges that people have been through but every single one of them which is so remarkable have made a change made a positive impact into their life and to other people's lives around that that's either through themselves or through their businesses too as well when i started my podcast over seven years ago well first it was called rerouting and then mm -hmm. very quickly it was at a crossroads with the naked podcaster and it was about bearing it all like sharing your story of struggle to success or trial to triumph and then mm -hmm. it it narrowed down into more parenting and entrepreneurism because a hundred percent of people that I was interviewing were entrepreneurs. And so I kind of niched it down, but those stories of trial, like, you know, when you interview someone whose biological father started to rape her at the age of nine until she was 21, like whole, you know what I mean? Like it makes a huge wow. impact because when you write a book, that's great, but it and it's your story, but that's why I wrote a book. And then I was like, I'm one story. I want to get everybody else's out there. So very similar, except I wrote one, not nine books, but that's fine. <laughs> um, um, so I get it. I get how that segue because it was the exact same way for me. We have so many parallels. It's like we're the same person. That's right. <laughs> um, tell me about blending families did your second wife your second wife had kids of her own also did yep. you ever have more kids and you divorced her and then remarried so let's let's talk a little <laughs> bit about that like that's kind of a happy ending right so it is it is, it is. so let's let's unpack that so she's uh from georgia and um she grew up with her mom and dad and then she got she was a teen mom so she had her first son when she was in high school mm. and she had to deal with that struggle and the uh, the guy that was uh was a boyfriend at the time left them so she grew up just raising her son on her own and i came into her life and his life when he was about 9 years old 
and was in Georgia. And then this is when I was working on a railroad, going through my own issues. And I'm dealing with all of that. And we decided to come together and start dating. So we started dating, sort of relationship kicked off. And uh, it was great. Um, and I got integrated into her son's life. And, you know, trying to be a dad to a nine-year-old, I've never, never done it. So, I, you know, that's new to me. And he doesn't know his dad, his, does, has, doesn't have a relationship with his dad. So all of this was new for him, for me, for his mom. Yeah. And it was a challenge. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to navigate that. And there was some bumps in the road in regards to how we parent, because I grew up in a certain type. I just actually got out of the military. So my mindset was kind of still around being in the military where you get up at a certain time, you do certain things. There's no talking back and stuff like that in regards to me being a little bit rigid and not be able to understand some of those things. So there were some bumps in the road around that in regards to like parenting and in regards to like the involvement of a step stepdad or not even a stepdad, a boyfriend. Uh, we wasn't even married at that time in regards right. to like, in regards to like your role and your place in regards to dating and how serious we are. So we we kind of like navigated that and some challenges around that. Um, then obviously my son got introduced into that uh, relationship to it as well. So he started building a relationship with um, our, our son, Corey. And then obviously um, Courtney started building a relationship with Omar and we started integrating that. Yeah. And then- then all of our other family members are starting to get involved into this. Eventually, um, things are going really well. And I took the job in Washington, D.C. And uh, we we eventually move, all of us move up to Washington, D.C. And we're doing great. Things are going great. We said, I propose, I uh, have a friend um, help me with, with um, like set everything up. And I proposed to her on one of those um, night crews in Washington, D.C., which was a really cool um, event. And um, I proposed to her. Eventually we get married um, and we drop like over $30,000 in a wedding and, um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then we go on our honeymoon and we go to the Bahamas and we come back for the Bahamas and things are going great for the first four or five months. And then right around New Year's, we get into this big argument, this big fuss, this big fight and things got pretty heated in regards to like words being said. Some things were pretty disrespectful and stuff around that. And, and at this time I'm going through the custody battle with my mm -hmm. ex-wife. So I'm flying for over three years. I'm flying back and forth to a courtroom. I'm staying in hotels. I'm getting rented cars, you name it in regards to still being present for my son and going to court, all of the child custody things that's tied into that, which was another level of frustration for myself. And things just blew up that night right around New Year's. And from there, that's when I said, I'm done and I'm and I'm going to file for divorce and we're going to end this. Uh, so after six months, we filed for divorce. But with uh, the laws in our Washington, D.C., you have to be separated for one year before it's actually finalized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up. That's how I ended up in Tampa, Florida. And that's what brought me to the brinks of quite a few different things around, especially tied around the suicide conversation that we just had earlier. Right. With all that being said, we were separated for several years. And that's when I went on my own journey of like, I need to work on myself and get myself into a, to be a better man, be a better husband, be a better father in regards to if I was to ever either be with another woman or reintegrate back into this relationship. And from there, that's when I've been on that journey. So that's when I went to Rush University to work on my PTSD, mm -hmm. work on the traumatic brain injuries. Then I went to Emory Hospital to work on myself then. And then a couple of years later, we said, uh, what do you think of, of the thought of us uh, getting back together and working our relationship and putting our family back together? And then from there, we got a uh, family counselor, which started working with us. And then we got got him involved. And then he got the kids involved. And all of us got into counseling together, try to work on our relationship and build that relationship. And that took process over two years or so. And once we uh, did that, um, things started looking good. Things started getting better. Our relationship started mending a whole lot better. And after that, I uh, said, um, I'm going to propose to her and see what she says. So anyhow, I proposed to her. She said yes. And from there, um, we got married uh, last year at our church uh, here in, um, in uh, Boynton Beach, Florida. What a journey. Holy cow. <laughs> and uh, you took, I want to point out, you you guys went to therapy, but you took the kids. And yes, I we think kids involved in therapy. Yep. That's, that's really important, too. Um, so, and there was a point where several of my kids went to therapy about a situation. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it was really helpful even though the situation didn't have any like i didn't wasn't part of it i was getting you get the backlash from kids you know and they have to I have to parent through some of this and it made a really big difference. The The kids that went to therapy and that I was present for a lot of their um, visits, it made a really big difference. So it was, it's great that you guys did that and included them because they're a huge part of the picture here. You know, they're going through it too. It was, you know, so when you, when I thought about it, you know, I came into uh, Corey's life at nine. Um, obviously we got divorced when he was in uh, middle school, high school-ish. And then we remarried when he was in college, you know, so yeah. I was out of, I was out of his life for quite a few years. So try to like reintegrate, build that relationship back. It was a lot of conversations, lots of things in regards to like just building that level of trust and our res mutual respect for one another because now he's a grown man, he's an adult, you know? So yeah. it was a completely different scenario. And the last time the way the relationship ended was in an argument, was with a, was in a fuss. So that was one of the biggest challenges that we had to work around. But I, I will say that it's a beautiful thing now that we have a great relationship. I actually just, me and him had a conversation yesterday on the phone, um, he, talking about his job that he has now. He's in the medical space, so he's doing really awesome now. But it was a big challenge in regards to that turnaround. You know, Omar was still a kid, so he was still dealing with that, going through that. And obviously, he's 17 years old, so he lives with me now. But mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest things that we had to deal with. But we worked through that, especially through the counseling, I think was one of the most key things for us in regards to learning how to have those those conversations as a step parent, as biological parents, yeah. and learn how to integrate actually now because there was so many broken things that was fractured between us. When you think about it, besides the four of us, then you had mom, you had dad, you had grandparents, you had other siblings and other things that came into the fold that we had to like really repair and fix. And obviously, obviously it did work out. With all your books and uh, the speaking that you do and the coaching that you do, if you could leave us on with a like a positive nugget of advice or s something that you say frequently, put you on the spot here. Yeah, so I I say quite a few different things. Um, you know, one of the biggest things for me, uh, you heard me mention inside of this podcast is that um, I'm always was one that was always bottling my emotions and bottling my feelings, mm. and I always share with people that we have to break that bottle in regards to getting the life that we want. And for me to break the bottle, I always had to start looking at some of the decisions I was making, the destination for where I wanted to, for my life, for my company, for anything, look at the destination and the direction of where I wanted to go. So I call that the three Ds, decision, direction, and destination. And then the biggest key to that is if you want any level of uh, success, if you want to gain anything in life, if you want to achieve anything, you got to be the first person to start participating in your rescue. And if you're struggling with something, dealing with something, you got to start participating in your own rescue. Oh, Michael, I love talking with you. We could talk for a long time. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing your story. I really, I'm really proud of you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Jennifer.